Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Richard Nisbet. He's the Theodore M. Newcomb Distinguished University Professor Emeritus at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. He's the author of several books, including Culture of Honor, The Geography of Thought, Mindware, and Thinking, a Memoir. And today we're talking about topics like attribution theory, reasoning, West versus East, cognitive differences, intelligence and IQ, and some other related topics. And I'm also leaving a link in the description box to our first interview. So Dr. Nisbet, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure to everyone. Thank you. Happy to be here. So I would like to start by asking you about one particular topic you've done work on. So attribution theory, what is that about? Well, uh, it's concerned with how people make causal judgments about the world. Uh, and uh, some of the most important causal judgments we make are causal judgments about why a particular person did a particular thing. And what always interested me most about attribution theory, which frankly I tended to find rather boring in general, was attributions of causes for one's own behavior. And uh, I was, the, the result of my work there convinced me that we are often very mistaken about why we do what we do. Uh, but I mean, attribution theory applies both to our own behavior and the behavior of, of other people or mostly to our own behavior? Well, both and, and also to just the physical world. I mean, hmm. to what do we attribute events in the physical world or the social world, including uh, ourselves? So give us perhaps an example of one particular behavior that people tend to be very bad at trying to identify the causes behind it? Well, there's a very systematic error that we tend to make in judging other people's behavior. Uh, we tend to assume that uh, the behavior is a reflection of, uh, a consequence of some uh, attribute that the person has. Um, so in particular, personality traits, abilities, and so on. And uh, in, in doing that, uh, we neglect the situation. Uh, the situation that the person is in is uh, the best way to understand why the person behaves as he or she does. And so in that particular case, we tend to, when someone does something, I guess that particularly if we don't like what they're doing, we tend to attribute that to some supposed intrinsic traits of them instead of uh, perhaps them being influenced by certain specific aspects of their environment or context, right? Exactly, exactly. And so, uh, and what about uh, people's understanding of the causes behind their emotions and arousal states? Because apparently we're also not very good at that either, right? Right. Uh, if we're aroused for whatever reason, uh, that arousal kind of sits there as a background and we can, uh, we can attribute uh, almost any event, uh, the cause of almost any event, uh, to something having to do with uh, arousal of, of some type. My One of my favorite examples of this is um, uh, research I did on insomnia. People mm -hmm. who have insomnia uh, often will report that what happens is that they're lying in bed and they're thinking about the thoughts of the day and maybe worried about some kinds of things. And the more they think about those things, the 
the the the harder it is for them to get to sleep. Uh, so uh, writing on the uh, the my research indicating that people often don't know what causes of their own behavior, we advertised for insomniacs uh, for and told them it's a study about dreams, and we would be asking them uh, about the dreams that they had had for the previous two days. Uh, and some of them, we said, we'd like you to take this pill and this pill will make you uh, make your heart you know, race a bit and make your breathing become more shallow and more frequent mm -hmm. uh, and so on. Symptoms of arousal that the insomniac has while he lies there unhappy trying to get to sleep yeah. uh and our expectation was that if people took this pill um uh, and the arousal occurs instead of a tr uh, in inferring that they must be very upset about this thing they'll infer right. oh well but i took this pill and that's what's making me arouse and fall asleep and that turned out to be true we kept records for uh two nights running before uh, they took the pill and after they took the pill. Uh, and uh, the nights when they took the pill, uh, they got to sleep uh, much more quickly. Then we <laughs> decided to risk uh, the whole logic of the experiment and tell some people that we were giving them a pill which would actually make them more aroused, uh, mm -hmm. uh, make them less aroused uh, at right. bed. So basically it would relax them, it would, it would lower the heart rate, it would uh, make breathing uh, deeper and, uh, and more regular. Uh, and uh, these people, we figured, well, they'll lie in bed, they'll get their, sim their arousal symptoms as usual. Uh, right. And... Um, so they will, uh, say, wait a minute, but I, I have this pill that's supposed to be calming me. So I must be in really bad shape. I must be very worried about this thing. I must be very much afraid of the exam that I'm about to take. And, uh, and so it would take longer to get to bed. And in fact, this is what happened. So the, the study, among other things, makes the point that we don't know uh, what's causing our own behavior. Uh, it's easy to get people to attribute uh, their uh, experiences uh, to some something where it, which is actually not uh, the cause of their experience. And so in that particular case, uh, particular example that you gave there of the pills, so this could have some implications as to why certain, for example, psychiatric medications work on some people and not others, right? It, it's possible. Um, I, I think that what, one implication of the, of the study is that um, uh, there should be uh, clear instructions about uh, what are the consequences mm -hmm. of a variety of drugs that people take uh, so that uh, they're not mistakenly attributing symptoms to some medication uh, or mistakenly attribute them to some events in their life or to some illness or something rather than to the drug which they've taken. Uh, and actually, this became, as a result of our research on this, uh, the FDA began to require very explicit uh, listing of, of symptoms to be expected of, of given drugs. Yes, th this is very interesting, the fact that we are not very good at identifying the causes behind our emotional states and our uh, arousal because i mean i'm not sure if this is a very good example of it or not you tell me but uh, i've seen this happening to me and also to other people where for example let's say that someone is stressed out and or they have for example a stomach ache or a headache and then 
uh, they're feeling really bad and something and suddenly something pops into their mind about something that happened recently or they are interacting with someone and then suddenly they start attributing them feeling bad to something the other person did or something that happened recently in their lives that perhaps they are more worried about it than they should be and you know so, uh, uh, things like that right it's there are all kinds of consequences of not being able to identify <laughs> correctly our behavior including our autonomic uh behavior yeah uh, and so i would like to ask you now about uh reasoning because uh, if you look across several different scientific disciplines there are different understandings of what human reasoning reason rationality is sometimes people use different names for it but from the perspective of social psychology what is reasoning what is reasoning yeah uh it's uh making inferences about the world uh it's um uh identifying uh, what kind of argument would make sense uh, uh, in a particular situation. Uh, uh, so it's it reasoning is what we're doing all the time, that is making inferences about the world. Mm -hmm. And when people talk about someone being rational or irrational, I mean, from the perspective of social psychology, shouldn't we take into account perhaps the context where the behavior occurred? I mean, are, are, what I'm trying to ask you is that aren't we perhaps sometimes uh, too quick to label a particular behavior or someone as irrational without taking into account the circumstances the behavior occurs in yeah i think uh often we're I, I don't think we very often attribute our own reasoning to failures we don't we never regard ourselves <laughs> as irrational uh but we're quite likely to regard other people as irrational often on the mistakenly because we don't know what it is that they know uh, that's causing them to behave the way they do. Uh, so I do think we can be too quick to attribute irrationality to people. Although I have to say, <laughs> I, 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 I often claim that people are reasoning badly. I wouldn't go so far as to say that they're irrational, mm -hmm. but, uh, but they're doing their reasoning uh, in a, a, a not completely adequate way. And I got a lot of criticism, people disliking the fact that I was uh, saying things about people that were unpleasant <laughs> to hear. <laughs> so, and who who am I to say that a particular reasoning is flawed? Uh, but that's no, that's, those days are long gone. Now it's accepted that psychologists uh, can say what's the right way to think, what's the right way to behave, and so on. <clears throat> they can be prescriptive. But uh, when I first started doing my research on reasoning, uh, it, psychologists felt that it was wrong uh, to sit in judgment uh, in any way. You just, just report the facts, ma'am, that's all. <laughs> but when it comes to some of those common errors that people make or in their reasoning uh, how uh, i i mean how able are we to improve on those errors and perhaps to become less prone to uh, falling uh, to committing them well Actually, there are, there's quite a disagreement about how much we can improve uh, reasoning. I happen mm -hmm. to think we can improve reasoning a lot, and I wrote a book <laughs> uh, about uh, the way various ways that we can improve our reasoning. Yeah. Not everyone 
uh, who studies reasoning is as convinced that uh, uh, that 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 errors that I psychologists have identified can be combated. Uh, but I am, and I've got some evidence about it. Okay, so t- tell us perhaps a little bit about that evidence, and if you want to illustrate it with uh, a couple of examples. Well, the main thing is um, uh, I started looking at the effects of a college education Mm -hmm. uh, on reasoning. And I was very dubious. I should back up here and say a history of psychology. Somehow it got to be a part of the psychologist's convictions that uh that you can't uh really fix people's reasoning you can't really teach people uh how to think you can't give them rules for reasoning uh that will be uh, effective all you can do is is uh, affect people's reasoning about some specific behavior uh things very concrete uh and the, the evidence for this was zip. I mean, <laughs> it was such terrible evidence. I mean, uh, and yet it's what all psychologists tended to believe. And and I did too when I started doing this research. I mean, I, my joke is, I would say, you know, we're, we, we, uh, we reason badly uh, often and uh, we, uh, and we're we're too dumb <laughs> to figure out uh, how to reason better, and if somebody gives us better reasoning rules, we're not going to be able to make use of them. <clears throat> uh, so I started doing research. I mean, a lot of the work I did was showing people make errors that can be thought of as statistical errors, mm-hmm. right. uh, and um, and e- economic reasoning errors. Uh, and so on. Uh, so I decided to look at the effects uh, of a college education uh, on these kinds of errors. To give an example of the kind of error, if you ask a college freshman, uh, maybe this is it may be no longer true because the world has changed. People are learning uh, a lot of things uh, that they didn't used to and uh, learning them earlier. But at the time we were doing this research was a couple of decades ago. Uh, if you would ask a, a, a university freshman, uh, you know, in baseball, uh, there are uh, usually in the first few weeks of the season, there are some batters with averages of 400 or higher. And yet no one's ever finished the season with such a high average. Why do you suppose that is? Well, people go straight to causal reasoning. It says, well, you know, the the batters make the necessary adjustments, or guys get cocky and they and they start goofing off and don't keep up their their excellent uh, sportsman uh, behavior. Uh, but it's important. The most important thing to say about that is, well, wait a minute, 400 is a very unusual, extreme kind of uh, event, uh, and it's not likely uh, to be continued to be repeated. It's just uh, uh, the first couple of weeks uh, of uh, behavior is a small sample of behavior, and you're much more likely to find extreme cases in a small sample than to find them in a in a larger sample. Well, it turns out that after four years of college, people are much more likely to give you that kind of answer, um, and uh, and in general, all kinds of of errors that people tend to make in statistical reasoning errors that they make because they don't understand uh, that uh, correlation doesn't prove causation. Mm -hmm. Uh, They they learn that in college. I mean, so college really does make you smarter. Uh, And uh, 
everyone I knew at the time was was astonished at how 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 much you can improve people's reasoning. And of course, if you look at whose reasoning is getting better along these lines, it's people in the social and behavioral sciences uh, who major in those things. People who major in uh, chemistry or English actually don't improve along the, along the lines of statistical reasoning, causal reasoning, uh, et cetera. And so since uh, we're talking uh, about being smart, let me ask you now about human intelligence and uh, literature on IQ. Um, to start off with, uh, what do you make of the behavior genetics literature on IQ? Because they talk there about uh, IQ having a genetic basis, about how heritable IQ is. And of course, they also talk about uh, environmental effects and how much the environment supposedly contributes to intelligence and IQ. Uh, what do you make of all of that? Well, uh, again, this is a, another case where psychologists uh, got things very wrong. I mean, there's a very famous book that was published uh, in the 90s um, by Hernstein, Richard Hernstein and Charles Murray. And they gave the, 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 the account that psychologists, it was this more or less a consensual account. That is, that uh, intelligence is primarily uh, genetically determined, uh, not in, entirely, of course, but uh, primarily that early childhood experiences don't have much to do with how intelligent a person is, that you can't intervene in, in, in ways that are going to make much of a difference uh, mm -hmm. to intelligence. Right. Uh, and they attributed some group differences in IQ test performances to genetic effects. Uh, and all of that turned out, and that's that's what I believed at the time that book was written. I largely believed those things myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I started getting to study these things systematically. And it turns out to be the whole ball of wax is wrong. I mean, uh, intelligence is not primarily de genetically determined. Of course, there's a component. Uh, I mean, some people, are, there's a better physical plant there that's uh, producing uh, inferences. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it, the actual genetic contribution. We don't know what the genetic contribution is, but the very way that uh, uh, genetic contributions were calculated uh, was uh, mistaken. Um, it, they, the, the, the uh, piece of evidence that they uh, gave uh, most credit to is that uh, if you look at identical twins raised in different environments, you'll find that the correlation is very high there, and it's double what the correlation is for uh, non-identical twins, which is right. the same as the as the correlation for uh, fraternal. Uh, I mean, for for uh, siblings uh, right. who are not who are not twins, mm -hmm. uh, and that sounds you know, boy, that that sounds like terribly good evidence, but. It turns out that if you look at identical twins who have been separated, you find that they tend to be raised in very similar environments. Uh, I mean, it's often the one twin, a parent can't deal with both twins, so they they, they ask their uh, the, 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 an aunt or uh, an uncle of, of the child, one of the twins, to raise the child. So the child tends to be raised in similar environments. Mm -hmm. So uh, to take the correlation between identical twins raised separately uh, as being strong evidence uh, for a, a, a nearly complete uh, genetic determination of IQ is quite mistaken. It's also mistaken for another reason. Uh, <clears throat> 
And we owe this to Jim Flynn, who's uh, who surprisingly showed that people are getting smarter, which is the world is getting smarter all the time. Everybody thinks, oh, people are getting stupider all the time. Everybody thinks they're stupid. <laughs> and it, it's one of those things, everybody, everybody thinks that the uh, uh, the crime rates are worse now than they've been mm -hmm. in the past. I mean, right. it, it's, it, and it, it's just a, a very consistent uh, uh, error uh, that people make. Um, but, uh, Flynn says, okay, let's let's think about basketball for a minute. <clears throat> if you raise identical twins in different environments, you're going to find out they're very, very similar with respect to basketball. Mm -hmm. uh, so but wait, wait a minute. Are these environments really different? I mean, suppose you actually did drop twins by helicopter into, you know, uh, <laughs> into one kid goes to Louisville, Kentucky, and the other kid goes to Miami uh, or to uh, San Francisco. They're not going to have the same environment. Mm. Uh, uh, I mean, they are going to have highly similar environments because of their genetic uh, uh, composition uh the tall strong fast kids are going to have are going to get into an environment they're going to they are going to see to it in effect mm -hmm. that they get into an environment which may which makes use of those talents they're going to and coaches are going to encourage them they're going to get picked on teams they're going to be chosen to play <clears throat> And they 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 create an environment for themselves which makes them much more similar to to each other uh, than two random people would be uh, because they have attributes which produce environmental effects. And Flynn says, and guess what? It's the same thing for intelligence that. <clears throat> people who have an interest in the world, people who like uh, to reason, et cetera, will get into environments. They will influence, they'll, they'll get into fast paced classes in school. They'll get encouraged in those things. So they end up uh, being much more similar uh, than randomly chosen people. But the environment has everything to do with the, with the resulting uh if, it, if you put that you know a, a kid in a closet uh, he's not going to be intelligent he's not going to be able to play basketball no matter uh, uh no matter what kind of uh, basic physiological plant uh they have and uh, how important do you think IQ is to human cognitive ability i'm asking you this because isn't it the case that there are other kinds of non-IQ cognitive skills that also play a big role. Uh, that's that's for sure <laughs> correct. Uh, the uh, Wall Street uh, Journal uh, columnist, um, uh, oh, I can't recall her name offhand, but has the i has this concept of. High IQ, stupid people. <laughs> uh, and anybody in academics knows immediately what you're talking about. <laughs> they have colleagues, <clears throat> unmistakably high IQ. You can't, you can't get a PhD without having a high IQ. But boy, can you ever be stupid, <laughs> even <laughs> though you have that uh, that uh, that uh, documented uh, stamp of uh, of high IQ. Right. Um, First of all, I, IQ, IQ tests emphasize to a very substantial degree, degree logical, purely logical operations, uh, problem solving uh, skills and so on, which don't have that much to do necessarily with the kinds of requirements <clears throat> uh, of everyday life uh, in order to be effective. Uh, and uh, the, the, so these so-called crystallized talents that is not much affected by the environment um 
they they are much less important much less important in being effective in the world uh, than you might think. And here's a an example, another example, owing to Jim Flynn. Uh, so let let's say you put uh, um, you have a ship that's uh, going it through the Arctic and it's full of Nobel Prize winners. And it gets stuck in the Arctic and it can't move. Uh, <clears throat> and you're going to ask, with all these high IQ people, how how will they fend for themselves in this kind of circumstance? And compare it to how a bunch of Eskimos uh, will move. And the Eskimos will know all kinds of things, ways to get food, ways to keep warm, and so on, uh, because they have these cognitive skills which they've been taught uh and the nobel prize but very few if any of the nobel prize winners will will have those uh uh those kinds of skills and donald trump uh used to uh when asked about uh his knowledge about uh various things because he's quite an ignorant man actually uh, says, well, you know, I have I have a giant brain, so I can figure these things out. Well, you know, just being smart won't do it uh, in most uh, for most of the things that we do. We have to have experience, or we have to be taught uh, ways of thinking. Uh, and IQ tests are sort of deliberately designed not to test things that we are taught. <clears throat> uh, so. Uh, so IQ, uh, you know, if you have a, an extremely high IQ, you are certainly going to have skills which have value in certain circumstances. Uh, but uh, uh, the learning is uh, the basis of, of most of our intellectual skills. And that's the other aspect that we have to keep in mind here, right? Because many of those cognitive skills that people have, not only in the West, but also across other societies, are actually culturally acquired. Right. Right. Well, uh, yes, I think you're, you're taking us toward this uh, research that I did looking at the way people reason uh, in the West and the way they reason uh, <clears throat> in East Asia. Right. Here's another case where, you know, I I, I was, I mean, even more, more than most psychologists, I was a universalist. I mean, you know, where people are, you know, all the same and partly because the well, most things that we care about have a very strong genetic component. And uh, I began working uh, this with a student from China who was absolutely brilliant. Uh, his name is Kaiping Peng. And after we'd been working together for a while, he said, you know, Dick, you and I think very differently in very different ways about all kinds of things. So I said, oh, well, tell me more. So he says, essentially, you know, you uh, you reason logically, you, you take apart the components of uh, some problem uh, and, uh, and reason about them. You focus on, uh, on some uh, situation, some aspects of some situation to the exclusion of others. But uh, Chinese uh, are much more aware of an of a total holistic situation. Uh, they pay attention to a wide range of factors uh, always. They're less concerned with uh, uh, logical thought. Uh, they're much less likely to uh, to focus on the attributes of some person or object, and much more likely to attend to well to situational factors uh, surrounding uh, 
uh, the event. So we started, I said, well, uh, gee, if that's true, uh, it should be easy to show. And so we started doing research and then ultimately with lots of other uh, East Asian uh, students as well, uh, Koreans and, and Japanese. And East Asians as compared to Westerners, Americans especially, but also uh, Europeans. Uh, uh, East Asians literally see more in any given situation than uh, Westerners do. So we would show picture, moving pictures of uh, underwater scenes uh, to uh, people and for, for 20 seconds. And then we'd say, tell me what you saw. The Americans would say, well, I saw three big fish swimming off to the left. They had red stipples on their bellies and they had uh, two fins on their back. Um, the, uh, the East Asians were much more likely to say, well, I saw what looked like a stream. The water was green. There were plants and and uh, and rocks on the bottom. And there were three big fish swimming off to the left. And they, so, and the East Asians were able to give you as much information about the attributes of the most salient objects as the Americans were but they gave you vastly more information about the context. And they start telling and when telling you what, what they saw, they start with the context. Uh, even the language is, is, uh, uh, is much more likely uh, to almost any kind of utterance is much more likely to refer uh, early on uh, to the context. So uh, an American might say, you know, this 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 uh, this, this uh, skiing is really great uh, in this location, and the East Asian is likely to say, uh, this location skiing is very good. I mean, they they, they want to they they want to establish context uh, early on. Uh, in a description of something. Um, if uh, you ask uh, kids, you show them a picture of a cow, a picture of uh, a panda, and, uh, and a picture of grass, you'll say, which two of these things go together? The Western was will, Western will say, uh, oh, well, the the cow and the panda go together because they're both animals, and the East Asian is likely to say the cow and the grass go together because the cow eats the grass, uh, and in general, uh, attention to relationships is much more a part of of East Asian. Uh, mentality than of uh, Western mentality. We're sort of crazy about categorizing things and we mm -hmm. categorize things constantly. And categorization is not as much a part of reasoning uh, in the East. Uh, um, so, and if you, you give logical problems to people, if they deal with uh, real everyday life events, um, the Westerner is able to reason in the standard deductive fashion, if A, then B, but if, uh, but the East Asian is much more likely to uh, be thrown off uh, by the features of the of the things that you're thinking about, and fail to uh, to to deal with them in a in a way that uh, uh, formal logic uh, can operate. So there are very substantial differences, and they and they uh, they have 
they have consequences in uh, in everyday life. One of my favorite examples of a difference, and I don't know why this difference exists, by the way, it's a, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a mystery to me. In the Western intellectual tradition, um, we we tend to assume that any any tendency of change, something increasing or something decreasing, will continue. Actually, first of all, there's an assumption that there won't be change. Uh, East Westerners are some for some reason inclined to think things don't change. Uh, and if they do, uh, they're going to continue in the direction in which you see them. You see an event here, then in a, in another one somewhat higher level, and then the next one somewhat higher level. Where, mm -hmm. What will the, the far future bring? The Westerner will assume that there's going to be a, just a, a continuation of whatever right. the, mo the movement is. The East Asian is much more likely to assume, oh, it's it's going to reverse itself. It's going to change, and this has real consequences. Um, it, if uh, if you show people a a stock stock performance, you know, two months ago it was it was at X level, uh, a month ago at X plus one, uh, yesterday at X plus two. Where will it be next week? The Western says, "Oh, it's going to, okay, it's going to continue that increase." The East Asian is much more likely to assume it's going to reverse course. Uh, it's it's going to change, and they will. This causes them to prefer a stock uh, which is losing value because it's going to turn around and go up uh, over a stock which is uh, gaining value. Uh, because it's going to go down, and this is actually a a, a good way to get poor, <laughs> to to sell your winners and and keep your losers uh, is is bad strategy. But even uh, you find this even with business school students, East Asian versus Western. <clears throat> so there are some quite marked differences in patterns of reasoning, East and West. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned uh, examples of some differences between East and, and West in terms of cognition, and there are others we could talk about here. But let me ask you a particular question about all of that. So because if people look at these differences, I guess that they could have two different kinds of attitudes. The first one would be if someone is, for example, ethnocentric, or if they think that their culture is superior to others in several different ways, they could look at these differences and say, oh, yeah, but we in the West, for example, the traits that we have are the best ones. They are the superior ones. They work everywhere. And the traits that people in, the, in East Asia tend to have, I mean, they are inferior. They don't work everywhere, something like that. But isn't it? Uh, it seems to me that the way we should look at this actually is that uh, culturally people have arrived at different solutions to different problems in different ecologies in societies that are socially structured in different ways that have different forms of establishing social relationships, for example, and so. I mean, it's not a matter of a set of cognitive traits or skills being uh, superior or inferior to another set. It's just that perhaps a particular set of cognitive skills works best in a given context. I mean, well, does that make sense? Or? Yes, I, absolutely. I mean, in fact, uh, our explanation for these differences uh, has to do with the fact that Westerners live in a different world than Easterners. Uh, there are fewer constraints uh, on uh, behavior uh, in the West. I mean, if there's 
greater freedom of action. Uh, so uh, people uh, can focus on some object that they want to have an effect on, and they they don't have to pay attention to contextual factors, certainly not to social uh, factors. Uh, and in the East, traditionally, that's not true. There's much more social influence on behavior. Uh, and uh, uh, we find that uh, uh, in, uh, and the explanation for this that, uh, that we prefer is that uh, the economy uh, in Greece uh, was uh, determined by the fact that Greece is largely mountains descending to the sea. So you don't have large agricultural plantations that, that doesn't work there. Uh, you have kitchen gardens, you have olive trees, you have, uh, and then you have the occupations of fishing and trading, which can be relatively isolated. You don't have to depend that much on other people. But in, in China, there's rich soil, excellent uh, uh, moisture available. And so you have large plantations. You always, I mean, for 10,000 years, you have large plantations there. But people are much more dependent on the behavior of other people in order to be effective. You can't just go out and, you know, and that's especially true of rice farming. Rice farming requires extreme cooperation uh, among people. And it turns out that uh, rice farmers are much more likely to think holistically uh, than wheat farmers in China, within China. Uh, we actually found, we looked at one Turkish uh, town where some of the people were mostly fishers or farmer, and uh, some were mostly farmers and some were mostly herders. And uh, the fishers and farmers have to cooperate with one another much more, have to deal, their effectiveness depends on the behavior of other people to a much greater extent than herders. It's just me and the sheep. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, sure enough, uh, the herding people are more analytic uh, and that they're more likely to pay attention just to the object and the uh, people who herd or farm for a living are have a much wider uh, uh, range of of, uh, uh, of, of thinking uh, and attend to a much wider range of events. Uh, I, I do, however, and I say, <laughs> look, Holistic thinking in and of itself, I mean, is uh, it has many advantages uh, over uh, 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 purely uh, logical or categorical uh, reasoning. Mm -hmm. uh, categorical reasoning uh, and logical reasoning have great advantages over holistic reasoning in some kinds of circumstances. Um, so let's put it this way. No one who's ever sat and listened to me talk for an hour about these differences says, oh, the Western way is better <laughs> or the Eastern way is better. They're, they're, they're different and they, uh, they're different and they're differentially useful <clears throat> for different kinds of tasks. Um, no, I was I was worried when I started the research. Oh, people are going to say, "Oh, this is ethnocentric." It's not, though. Mm -hmm. First of all, it, those are the facts. So, <laughs> it's not being ethnocentric to say, "Well, oh, this person reasons differently from that." But also, it just makes zero sense to say mm -hmm. that one set of people ha are have an advantage across the board. They don't. Holistic reasoning. Although I do think in general, I do think you you, you can use what the critic the stances, the reasoning stances of, of one group to criticize uh, the reasoning stances of others. And I think as I studied Eastern thinking, uh it becomes clearer and clearer to me that um 
the habitual way of reasoning of of Westerners uh, leaves you prone to certain kinds of errors. So for example, in causal attribution, uh, Westerners are li particularly likely to make what my friend Lee Ross called the fundamental attribution error, mm -hmm. that is to attribute behavior to personality and to something intrinsic to the individual rather than to the situation. And we have the data on that. I mean, in a given situation, East Asians are less likely to make that error. Uh, and uh, so you can you can say, well, what we know that human beings can be more holistic. They can pay attention to a wider range of events than they do. And uh, uh, so you can use one habitual form of reasoning to criticize others, uh, mm -hmm. other forms of reasoning. Uh, and by the way, if people from one kind of society, a Western society, for example, move to a East Asian society or vice versa, um, I mean, if they grew up being exposed to a Western culture and they acquired culturally these cognitive the traits, uh, are they able to, um, I mean, acquire the opposite kind of traits if they are exposed and live in uh, the other kind of culture? I mean, how malleable are these traits, basically? Well, they're, they're certainly malleable to a degree, uh, but uh, it's a great question to ask, how malleable for mm -hmm. how many, uh, but we, we looked at <clears throat> uh, East Asians who um, had lived for at least 10 years, specifically Chinese, in Silicon Valley. <clears throat> mm -hmm. If they had lived in, in Silicon Valley in the U.S. Uh, for 10 years or more, their re their reasoning was uh, identical to uh, to European Americans. Uh, now, um, and and it there's it can probably and we do know for some people. Uh, we look at East Asians in Canada. Um, Look at self esteem. Westerners have higher self esteem. We think we're terrific <laughs> than <laughs> um, East Asians do. And uh, if you look at uh, uh, recent immigrants to Canada, they have that relatively low self esteem mm -hmm. after they've been there for uh, for many many years. Somewhat higher second generation uh, Chinese Canadians uh, are. Uh, m much more similar to Western Canadians than to uh, Asian Canadians, and by the third generation, there's no difference. And he says they're so they're 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 highly malleable. Well, I I have a joke. Uh, it's not a joke. It's it's a funny story uh, about um, a social psychologist who became a, a cultural psychologist himself and lived in Japan. Uh, for many years studying the culture and it was time for him to he got his PhD sort of while he was there and uh, he, he started to apply for academic jobs um, and uh, he wrote uh, a letter which he asked his advisor to critique mm -hmm. and the letter said uh, I write you in hopes that you might be willing to uh, to look at my record, which is not brilliant in every respect, I, I'm sure, but there are some advantages which you might, and his advisor said, what the hell are you doing, man? I mean, you, you don't <laughs> hem and haw and apologize for anything. God damn it, you're terrific, and they should know it. <laughs> so, um, anyway. So, yeah, we can change. Um, Great. Uh, so let me ask you about one last topic then. Uh, 
I would like to hear your thoughts on the so-called replication crisis, particularly in psychology. Uh, because, of course, people have been very worried about it. But I guess that uh, another way of looking at it is, uh, or one question we could ask is, so if, for example, we try to replicate an experiment with different people in a different set of circumstances and it doesn't replicate, do is the conclusion necessarily that it was just a fluke and the original finding we probably should ditch it? Or how exactly should we interpret such a result? Well, uh, I have, have uh, an anecdote about my own research, which uh, is useful to think about in this context. So I did the, the, in, the insomnia study. It was done decades ago, and it was clearly important. And so lots of people rushed to replicate it and failed. And actually, it didn't bother me. I mean, I, I knew that my study, and I, lo I looked, at the behavior of people, I looked at the looked at the data. I, I just there was no way that that this was you know that this was an error. It might have been a fluke, but it wasn't an error. Uh, and uh, so my colleague on this, uh, Michael Storms, says, "I don't know what the hell's wrong with these other people. This is not a hard study to replicate. I'll I'll replicate it myself." <clears throat> and he couldn't replicate it. So again, it still didn't. I mean, I said I know that you know that that what happened there, which by the way was Yale, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, twenty years after the research was done, a social psychologist says I know why you got your results and other people didn't get the results. Uh, he said I've I've looked at. Uh, there's a, a, a scale, a test that people make of, of need for cognition, need for mm -hmm. thinking, people people who enjoy it, and people do it a lot and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and he said, I re replicated your study for people with high, the, high need for cognition and didn't replicate it for people without a high need for cognition. And of course, mm -hmm. Yaleys are likely to have higher need for cognition than the people at all these other universities. So uh, the moral of that story is you can't assume that it's a fluke or an experimental error that's produced a given result. Uh, the um, What was particularly infuriating to me about the uh, the studies that uh, were in the initial study that was published in Science, uh, showing that social psychology studies were particularly likely to not replicate. Um, the first thing to say about that is that a high fraction of the studies that they looked at were these studies where you, <clears throat> uh, you expose people to some weak or subliminal stimulus uh, or a stimulus they're not likely to notice, uh, and then this affects their behavior. Um, and, uh, well, for example, I mean, people who uh, uh, are, uh, uh, they're, they're, they, they put their mouth by have, holding a pencil, they hold it in a particular mm -hmm. way in their mouth so that it either sort of mimics smiling Right. or Phoenix frowning. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so uh, that was one of the studies that they was in their sample to replicate. Mm -hmm. Now, the person who did the study uh, uh, videotaped the person and the person knew that he was being videotaped. He was highly self-conscious about the position of his mouth. Thank you. And so you don't get the effect, you know, of, of the 
pe people finding that the j jokes are funnier if their mouth has been put into a smiling position than if it's been put into a frowning position. A sort of colossal stupidity to <laughs> to do that study and videotape people. I mean, it's just, uh, but it's much worse than that, what they did. And the, 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 the particular fact that they, they looked at, well, these studies which look at uh, uh, a, uh, the effect of some weak cue on behavior, some uh, cue likely, not likely to be noticed, they are in, inherently unstable because if the, if the stimulus is weak enough, it never gets into the system. If it's uh, made highly salient, more, more salient, uh it uh it may mean that you don't get you don't get the uh, the phenomenon at all so a lot of those studies that failed uh were of that type but here's the real killer if they for some of the studies the the replicators checked with the original investigators that here's the protocol is this right those study the study what studies where they did that and the original investigator says right you got it that's fine those studies replicated at a high rate where the investigator was not asked to comment on the procedure or where i suppose where you've said no that's that's wrong you shouldn't do it that way uh, those were the ones that were quite likely to not replicate so the 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 research the research uh, the replicators research doesn't replicate <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> it's bad research now we've had a coming out of that tradition uh, uh, there's there is you know critical um, skills that we that we we do need to pay attention to. It's probably more things should be in included in, uh, there should be more detail in what the, in the methods sections of studies about exactly what was done. Uh, and they pointed to a lot of statistical errors that uh, people tend to make or methodological errors. Um, it, it made me, one of the things that sometimes just they don't uh, look at enough cases, they don't run enough subjects uh, in the experiment, and that that's you're more likely to get a fluke if you have a small sample mm -hmm. uh, of people. And so, I for some reason this made me go back and look at a lot of my early research, and I was appalled to see how low the ends were. <laughs> as many of my early studies, I mean, ends of 12 and 15 per cell. I mean, this doesn't, uh, you are more likely to have a fluke uh, in that situation. Uh, if you were, uh, and I, I stopped doing that, not because of some kind of principle. I just began to real, you, you begin to get, you know, how basically you run 30 subjects per cell, because if the effect is there, 30 is enough to get it. And if the effect is uh, is not there. Uh, Thirty is enough to tell you it's not there. <laughs> I mean, it's just it just becomes part of the lore. Uh, but some people continue to use very small ends, and they are more likely to get result a uh, false result, or they're likely to say um, um, to to report a result as if it were it had been predicted when it really had not been predicted. And that's going to turn up lots of flukes. If you get some result and you come around, you can always explain it. You can always come up with an explanation. Well, I might, might have it. Uh, so that's, a, that's an error uh, in the scientific process. So yeah, there are problems, but the, the nothing like as great as they, uh, as they said. In, in fact, there have been a couple of studies uh, since uh, which were not as flawed as the original studies, and the rates of replication, instead of being 50% or more like 80 or 85%, which still isn't great, 
Uh, but it's nothing like as bad as <clears throat> what they were claiming. But I mean, then if uh, just because a particular study does not replicate, <clears throat> it does not necessarily mean that we can then just safely ignore that finding. Right. right. Yeah, and that that's the lesson of my insomnia the study. Yeah. You can't you can't assume uh that that what it just it could be lots of reasons that you might not get uh the same result again, even though the original study was was well done. Uh and uh um and so you it it may have been a correct result for that population at that time with those particular materials that were used. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. News, but that's perhaps a good point to end our conversation on. Uh, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find your work on the internet? Are there any good places? Uh, well, uh, on this, I think the, mo the most uh, useful thing for people to do <clears throat> is to look at uh, my book, called Mindware, which is, talks about all kinds of errors of reasoning that are correctable. Uh, and I also boiled down a lot of the work in that into a, uh, 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 a, a MOOC, a massive uh, study, inter internet uh, mm -hmm. study, uh, which uh, by now has had 20,000 people have completed the course. Wow. Uh, I, I reached vastly more people uh, with that teaching than in all of my in vivo teaching in my whole career, which is very satisfying to me. Okay, it's called great. Mind. So, sorry? It's called, it's called Mindware. But... Oh, okay. Okay, so I'm also leaving a link to it in the description box of this interview if people are interested. So thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon and PayPal. The links are in the description down below. And also please share, like and hit the subscription button. The show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Perga Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunde, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf, Alex, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Erika Lenny, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Rui Nassi, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavanagh, Michael Stormier, Samuel Andre, Francis Forte, Agnunus, Fergal Cousin, Hal Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrand, John Linear, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, John Weira, Tom Hummel, Sadus Franz, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila de Zaraújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Anik Punta, Radana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stazewski, Nalek Bach, Guy Madsen, Gary G. Hellman, Simon Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentin, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litsky, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Giorgio Stiofanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wallazin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Moray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheist, Larry Dilley Jr., Old Herringbun, Starry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandin, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Paul Crowleys, Kate Von Goller, Alexander Hubbard, Liam Dunaway, B.R., Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, 
Jonas Hurtner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings and David Pinsoff. A special thanks to my producers Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Van Agdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Miller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Giancarlo Montenegro, Alni Cortes, Nick Golden and Rosie, and to my executive producers Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all. <laughs>